All right, so I have 28 slides in 20 minutes, so I'm going to make this very quick. Um, lots of material, so let's get going. Oh, and before I start, uh, this talk doesn't represent the opinions of Berkman at Harvard, Indiana, or any other organization. I'm here by myself. All right, so I'm going to describe who I am. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the credit system and credit agencies. I'm then going to go into some motivations as to why someone would want to manipulate the data in their credit report or someone else's. Uh, and then I'm going to finish with uh, some interesting techniques from abuse and manipulation of the credit reports. Uh, the paper that's online now has fixes for these flaws, but there's just not enough time to cover it. Uh, these techniques are not mine. Uh, they have been created and discovered by a thriving community of credit hackers uh, who congregate in one or two internet forums. But these techniques are really not known outside those, those forums, and they're not forums that are frequented by security folks. They're finance geeks. Um, and I think it's really interesting to analyze these techniques through the lens of the computer security community because you can really see some amazing parallels. And as I'll go into things, we'll see things like race conditions and buffer overflow attacks and these other techniques that are used commonly in the security space and just haven't been looked at or addressed in these other areas. All right, um, so a little bit about me. I'm a student fellow at the Berkman Center at Harvard, PhD candidate. I do privacy and security research. Um, you may have heard about some research I did a couple years ago where I made a fake boarding pass website for Northwest Airlines that got my house raided by the FBI. <laughs> the lesson from that story is always have a good lawyer. Since then, I've done a few more things in, in the last few months. Uh, just, uh, I think, a month ago, 38 experts from the security and privacy community sent an open letter to Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, to chastise him for not turning SSL on by default for Gmail. I wrote that letter. Um, I have, thank you to that one person. Um, <laughs> We have an open uh, comment that we submitted to the Copyright Office to argue that consumers should be able to hack the, DM, or the DRM uh, for music, movie, and media stores that go bankrupt and, and the authentication servers shut down. You may have seen in the last week or two that the content creators said that consumers do not have an expectation uh, of being able to access their works deep into the future. We disagree with that, and so we want consumers to be able to hack their works and play them, things they've legally paid for, uh, well into the future. And finally, I also created a tool for Firefox called Taco that opts you out of behavioral advertising. It came out three months ago and has over 100,000 users. If you're worried about your privacy online and you don't want these companies to follow you around the web, you should use it in addition to tools like NoScript and Adblock Plus and blah, blah, blah. OK. So a quick introduction to how the credit system works. There are three main credit agencies that store information on around 90% of Americans. They get information on all your, your financial transactions, but mainly the ones involving loans. All right, what, what does a, a credit reporting agency know? So every time you apply for a card, a loan, a mortgage, a student loan, and something from a medical bill, they find out about the application, and then they find out every month how much you've paid, how much you currently owe, whether you paid it on time, um, information like that. If you've, if you've missed payments, if you've declared bankruptcy, all that information, they store it. So the three agencies get that information directly from the lenders and the financial institutions. They get it directly, which means they don't synchronize the data amongst themselves. And it means that th three different agencies can have three different sets of data, depending on when they get it and any mistakes that might be in the data stream. In most cases, it's done via uh, tape, tapes and, uh, that are sent once a month by the banks. And these can have all kinds of errors. Um, Based on this information, they compile what are called credit reports. And from your credit report, which details all your past financial activity, you get a credit score. When you apply for a credit card, they look at the credit report and the credit score and figure out whether you're a deadbeat or not. The important thing to note is that the three credit agencies do not compare notes. And so when you manipulate data held by one agency, the other two never find out about it. So I don't know if you can see this, but this is a screenshot from 
Um, actually, my report, uh, but the numbers have been changed. But, but this is an example of just one card. So it tracks the account number, how much, the maximum amount you've ever spent in one month, how much you've, uh, you've spent the most recent month, how, your maximum credit line, and then you see the little stars at the bottom, and each one of those is, is, uh, re records a month in which the credit agency got data. All right, credit inquiries are really important, and they'll, they'll the, 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 the talk will be heavily focused on these things. So each time you apply for a credit card or a loan or anything else, uh, the act of, of uh, asking for your report causes what's called a credit inquiry. Um, these inquiries themselves show up on your report. There are two types of inquiries, though. There are what are called hard inquiries, and these relate to the creation of new accounts. So when you apply for a new mortgage or a new car loan or a new credit card, an inquiry is added to the report. Now, the lenders only request one credit report at a time. So typically, only one of the three credit agencies is contacted, and that, agent, and that credit agency will add an inquiry to the report held on you. Soft inquiries are non-harmful. They're not shown to anyone but you, uh, and they're, they're, they reflect things like uh, identity checks, uh, for, uh, for apartment rentals or jobs. Uh, when you request your own credit report, those are soft inquiries. And any time you have an existing account with someone, that lender will usually check up once every couple of months just to see that you haven't become a total deadbeat. Um, and that is also considered a, a soft uh, inquiry. Now, the important thing to note is the soft inquiries are not shown to anyone but you, and they're n in no way harmful at all. Um, all right, so if you get more than, say, four or five inquiries in a single six-month period, your, uh, this, the, the credit uh, companies that have basically decided that that's a negative thing. You're shopping around for credit, you've gotten four, five, six new loans, they'll cut you off and they won't give you any more credit for maybe six to 12 months. Um, and so some of the attacks that I'll describe in a few minutes look into this question of, well, how do we either erase these inquiries or how do we make it so that these inquiries don't show up as fast as they otherwise would? This is a screenshot of a hard inquiry from my report. You can see that these are all related to credit card applications. And you'll see, as you can see, that they're all for the same date. And I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, and then these are for soft inquiries. And these are from banks that I already had accounts with. Um, and these are har harmless. All right, so motivations. Why would you want to mess with your credit report? The techniques I'm going to describe, they can only really be used by people with good credit. And the people who've been hanging out in these forums, most of them seem to have spectacular credit, and they've used these to actually make real money. So there are three way, main ways to make money that I'll go into. The first is sign-up bonuses. So many credit cards will give you money for signing up for a new card, sometimes in the range of maybe $100 or $200 per card, which is you know, not terribly huge, but uh, given enough credit cards, that, that adds up fast. Uh, the second bonus are what I call non-cash bonuses. So these are uh, airline miles, free rooms and hotels, uh, that sort of stuff. And then the third and most lucrative uh, benefit are 0% balance transfers. Uh, and these can be arbitraged, uh, and I'll go into that in a minute to make uh, some fairly significant profits. So as an example, Sony will give you 100 bucks for getting a new card. United Airlines will give you 30,000 bonus miles, which is enough for a free domestic ticket. Or two, or two of these equals one um, uh, international ticket to Asia or Europe, and Citibank will give you a huge pile of money at 0% with no fees. All right, so the balance transfer arbitrage, which is the most interesting of these attacks. You borrow a huge amount of money at 0%. You ask the bank to send you a check instead of paying off an existing loan. You put it in the bank, and you get a CD or a savings account, and you uh, after one year, you pay it all back and you collect the interest. You know, thirty thousand dollars. This is real, real money. A hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, as I'll get into in a, in a few minutes. Then we're talking, uh, you know, five, ten thousand dollars a year, uh, given decent interest rates. All right. Um, now, these techniques that I'm going to describe are somewhat limited, or the techniques I just described are, are somewhat limited by the fact that you can only get four or five cards uh, in any uh, six or twelve month period. Right, so you know, that's some income, but not huge amounts. So the question is, how can we raise this limit? How can we make it so that we can get many, many more cards uh, without any of the lenders finding out? So what I'm going to describe now are the application of um, 
several techniques, so race conditions, buffer overflows, and then the abuse of uh, open, or, uh, failing open or phase, failing closed system design. And I'll cover these one by one. So the first thing that these credit hackers uh, on these forums discovered was that it takes one or two days for inquiries to show up on a card or on a credit report, which means that if you simultaneously apply for 40 or 50 credit cards in a single afternoon, <laughs> you can be approved for most of them, if not all of them. Now, obviously, there are some limits. So you can usually only apply for one or two cards per lending institution. So you can't apply for 10 credit cards from Citibank, for example. But there are enough banks out there that you can apply for huge numbers of cards. Now, in the case of a balance transfer, they'll send you the check within five or 10 days of the card. And then you, know, you wait another five or 10 days for the check to clear, which means by the time that that information about that, about that account has been sent to the, to the banks, to the other lenders, that money can be long gone. Now, in, in the case of the people I'm discussing in this paper, most of them are law-abiding, so they're putting the money in the bank, and they're not running off with it. But if these attacks were used by an evildoer, you could very well see that this money would be out of the country before the banks had even heard about this. So on these forums, reports of two or $300,000 in 0% balance transfers are extremely common. Um, credit, these, these hackers report getting 30 or 40 or 50 cards in a single day, they're very successful. Um, so for a year or so, that your credit report is completely shot. No one will give you any new, uh, new credit, which in, in many ways is actually a great f way to protect yourself from identity theft, right? So, <laughs> Once your credit is maxed out, you know, it's not worth stealing anymore. Um, okay, so the second technique that I think is really interesting is uh, what they call it bumpage. Uh, so two of the three credit bureaus, the TransUnion and Equifax, store both the soft, which are the non-harmful credit inquiries, and the hard, the harmful credit inquiries in the same FIFO-style buffer, which means that if you request your own credit report once a day for 60 days, you can push out all of the old negative inquiries. Um, now, these can be done via free, free or, or uh, maybe $9.99 a month credit monitoring services. Um, my paper goes into more depth as this, and there are a few techniques you have to avoid, so doing it more than once a day can actually cause uh, your report to be split into multiple segments. It's, just, it's, it's complex, but it's really bad, but um, once a day seems to be fine. Um, one of the credit agencies has discovered that this is happening and is manually adding the old inquiries back onto reports, but people report that you can still uh, flush them out again and, and, and remove them. So it's a, it's a game of cat and mouse of one side deleting the inquiries and the credit agencies adding them back on again. All right, and the third attack, which I, I think this one is pretty cute too. Um, so a few years ago, states started passing laws requiring what are called credit freezes. Uh, and after one state after another passed them, eventually the credit agencies decided to apply these across the board. So you as a consumer can contact the credit agency and ask them to lock your report. You give them a PIN number or a password, and it ensures that no one else can access your report uh, at, for, for that time. If you want to apply for a new loan, you have to call up the credit agency, give them your password or PIN number, and either they will open up your report for that specific lender or open it up for a 24-hour period. They usually charge between 5 or $10 uh, a go for this. Um, and when this legislation was being proposed, the credit agencies pushed back really hard. They didn't want to have a simultaneous credit freeze. So there's, there's something else called a credit alert, which is you've been uh, a victim of credit fraud, and you can create a credit alert, and the three agencies are required to simultaneously give that information to all their, to the, to their competitors. So you, you do one credit alert, and everyone gets it. With a credit freeze, they didn't want to do that. And so what you can do, um, you can abuse this, this, this technique to basically control which credit agencies the, the banks can have access to. You, you have control over the three reports. If one of the reports happens to have far more bad information on it than another, you simply freeze that report, and the other two are left uh, open. And so, as I said before, because um, the banks only request your report from one of the three agencies. It's quite possible to have uh, really bad information on one. Uh, and as I described in the previous attack, you know, with two of the three lenders, uh, people have been able to successfully remove negative information from, from those reports. So um, what you can do, essentially, is freeze a bad report. 
uh, and then apply for cards. And many of the financial institutions, when encountering a frozen report, rather than turning a customer away, what they do instead is just contact another credit agency to get the report. So rather than failing uh, close, they're failing open. Right? This is a really, really simple technique. And the best part about this technique, I think, is the fact that there is no downside. If the bank refuses to contact that alternative credit agency, not, no trace is left on your report. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful technique. All right, so um, these techniques uh, right now have been uh, used heavily by those uh, in online financial forums um, like Fat Wallet and, and a few others. Um, but they haven't really been used by the credit hackers, or by the uh, identity thieves. And I think that now that these techniques are going to get a little bit more attention, uh, they could very easily be used by identity thieves. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of strange, right? But now that the interest rates have dropped to 1.5 or 2%, the actual legitimate profits that you can get from the arbitrage schemes are fairly low now. So you're looking at like $4,000 uh, profit for borrowing $200,000 at 0% which for many people who are going to invest the time and risk, and that I means there's a little bit of risk, but for the people, it's, maybe this isn't a, a good payoff. But for an identity thief who's not actually going to pay the money back after one year, the, the lowering of the interest rates actually has zero impact on them. Uh, and if anything, maybe the banks have more money to lend to the identity thieves now that the credit hackers aren't using these techniques as much. Um, so uh, I have some fixes that I outline in my paper. They're not rocket science. I mean, these are techniques, these are flaws that we've seen again and again in the security community, and the solutions you know, are things like separate you know, the hard inquiries from the soft inquiries. These are, these are not rocket science. So um, more information. Uh, the paper was published in First Monday, which is an online journal, peer-reviewed journal. It was published yesterday. It's firstmonday.org. Um, you can get the full paper there with more information. These two forums are a wealth of information. Um, credit boards and fat wallet. Uh, one thing, the techniques that I've described, um, they're not so easy as they sound. Um, and there have been people on these forums who've sort of tried to do it but haven't done the required homework and have completely destroyed their credit reports in the process. So um, I'm not recommending that you try this out. And in, in, in a sort of strange way, the identity thieves have, again, a, le a leg up here, right? So they can experiment with other people's credit reports. And when they screw up, ah, whatever. It's someone else's report. Um, anyway, that's it. <laughs>